Fyodor Pavlovich would get into bed with a curse and sleep the sleep of the just. Something of the same sort had happened to Fyodor Pavlovich on Alyosha's arrival. Alyosha pierced his heart by living with him, seeing everything and blaming nothing. Moreover, Alyosha brought with him something his father had never known before, a complete absence of contempt for him and an invariable kindness, a perfectly natural, unaffected devotion to the old man who deserved it so little. All this was a complete surprise to the old profligate who had dropped all family ties. It was a new and surprising experience for him who had till then loved nothing but evil. When Alyosha had left him, he confessed to himself that he had learned something he had not till then been willing to learn. Well, hello again, and welcome to book three of the Brothers Karamazov. And I hope you're enjoying your reading, and I'm excited to share some thoughts with you. Um, as we always do, let's just kind of get ourselves settled into the landscape of book three. And once again, uh, as last time, I'm going to be borrowing some thoughts from Joseph Frank our wonderful biographer of Dostoevsky. And he uh, puts actually books three and four into pers perspective. And I think that it's, it's helpful for us. Um, books three and four consist of a round of visits that Alyosha makes to various people. So you're gonna be seeing, and you've seen it in book three, this suspense that Dostoevsky is building, Alyosha, has to see these people and he knows it. He feels this intensity in his heart. And we're just going to keep being reminded that Alyosha is the center of all of the, of the different characters and events. And of course, we've met new characters who are developed more fully. We will get to that. And I mentioned to you last time, this is all happening under the shadow of the monastery. Um, so we want to keep that in mind. We are first introduced in book three to the history of Smerdyakov, um, who, according to rumor, is the illegitimate son of Fyodor. His mother was stinking Lizaveta. She is, of course, known as the Holy Fool. She was treated kindly, as was the tradition in, in, in Russia. She gave birth to Smerdyakov, excuse me, to Smerdyakov in the garden of the Karamazov dwelling. Keep in mind the importance of gardens. That's really important in this novel. And the choice of this loca locale is, is kind of an indirect suggestion that he is indeed the father. The question of how she managed to actually climb over that strong fence to get into the garden is referred to twice in the crucial scene on the night of the murder of Fyodor. And although the narrator shrugs it off, the suggestion of this uncanny dimension um, gives a symbolic overtone that we're going to see develop. Um, and also, um, we have questions as this develops with Smerdyakov with the father's relationship with the servant Grigory. You've seen how he's intensely religious. He's, he's painted as kind of a semi-literate religious fanatic. Um, and this opens up a dramatic debate about um, faith and reason. Dostoevsky's aim is to show us that the moral psychological difficulty of, oh gosh, this amoral um, reason that's against faith, how it sustains in, in, how it sustains itself using sophisticated language of um, poets or scientists, um, plays on the, the primitive workings of the mind. So throughout this novel, we have uh, sophisticated scholarly talk, as well as kind of um, the base emotions of the character. And Dostoevsky wants to show how they're at play with each other or at war with each other. Um, we see that... Um, 
The continuing language of insect is used. These characters call themselves an insect or they're vile. Um, we see a lot of drunkenness, um, superstition, very realistic um, portraits of peasant life in Russia in the 19th century. Um, all characters in the novel are forced to make a decision um, between these extreme views that we're going to see. So just keep that in mind. Um, we also then see Alyosha has an encounter with Dimitri. These are these feverish monologues, which we'll look at um, with Dimitri. And they, they kind of almost take on a mythical stature. Um, so let's actually, I think we can now um, get into our first question. So last time I asked you about this conflict between faith and reason, and there are some pretty strong ones, weren't there? We have um, questions, is there a God or is there not? And we have the conflicting answers with Ivan and Alyosha. And as Dostoevsky's laying this foundation for what's going to happen, he knows every character has to struggle with that as Dostoevsky himself struggled with that as well. So in looking on this uh, reason and faith, I wanted to draw your attention. You know, I've mentioned to you that Dostoevsky has lots and lots of literary motifs. And I believe I mentioned to you before, but it bears repeating the image of suffering children is extremely important for Dostoevsky. This was for him the ultimate um, argument against the existence of a good God. Because remember, in this whole novel, the characters are struggling with, how can a good God exist when I see children suffering so much? This was a primary symbol for Dostoevsky. And so um, there is a story about a baby. Um, and in that story, there's a discussion about suffering children. So I just wanted you to realize that this is how Dostoevsky sets up the conflict between reason and faith with that very um, powerful image. Also, um, there's a very important um, passage in chapter three that I wanna read to you. And because there are some who believe that the translation that we have actually misses the point. So let me find the passage for you. We have in uh, chapter three of book three, when um, Dimitri is speaking to uh, his brother, he does mention, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, he says, all we Karamazovs are such insects and angel as you are. Just as just kind of a side note, when he is talking about his own sensuality, this is called The Sensualist, this book, He's an insect, um, but Alyosha is always described as the angel. Now, you, I'm sure, saw Dimitri is talking about the battle between purity and um, vice in each human soul. And when he talks about that, he says a very interesting thing. I'm on the bottom of page 76. He says, here the boundaries meet and all contradictions exist side by side. I am not a cultivated man, brother, but I've thought a lot about this. It's terrible what mysteries there are. Too many riddles weigh men down on earth. We must solve them as we can and try to keep a dry skin in the water. Beauty. I can't endure the thought that a man of lofty mind and heart begins with the ideal of the Madonna and ends with the ideal of Sodom. Um, that's kind of venturing into another one of our other questions on beauty. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention when he says contradictions existing side by side. According to uh, Russian scholars, if you break the Russian down, a better way to translate it is here is where the two banks of a river meet. The reason this is so important is apparently if you look at it in the Russian, the way Dostoevsky uses this language is going to um, reappear in book five when Ivan does his famous you know, poem of the Grand Inquisitor and fully reveals how his idea of reason cannot accept the mystery of a god 
or the mystery, let's say, of our broken human nature. And so this is an extremely important passage because let's think about it. This idea of contradictions and side by side, it's actually also in a fascinating way connected to Euclidean geometry. The idea of Euclid and geometry always comes back into Dostoevsky. He is looking at the men in his generation who want everything to fit into a math table, a math problem, or, or um, in a sense, they enter a mental breakdown. There's no room for the idea of mystery. And so when Dmitri brings this up, Dostoevsky is highlighting we have this conflict of reason and faith, and the brothers, they're going to split ways with how they ultimately will handle it. Because if you pay attention to Dimitri, he's tormented, he's in agony, he knows very well what's going on. But if you re- read that passage again, does he accept the paradox in life? I, I think so. Even if it's an initial acceptance, I think at the end of the day, he can accept this paradox in life. And you'll see with Ivan, he cannot, he cannot accept that. So it's two very different ways of dealing with the conflict of reason and faith. I also thought we should briefly bring up in this topic, the subject of Balaam. So, you know, in the Old Testament, um, there is the prophet who is reproached by the ass that he is writing. Okay. And then he's later rebuked by God's angel. Um, He's on his way to go meet an enemy of Israel. And so, you know, we have the talking ass. Of course, this is um, the prime example of a story from scripture that the sophisticated intelligentsia of Russia in the 1860s, this is something they would make fun of and and reject. So Dostoevsky is putting it right there in the open. Now, really in the novel, um, Balaam is a symbol, Balaam's ass for Smerdyakov, right? You see how he's equated with that. That's a motif for him, like the insect. However, I also think that Dostoevsky wants to show that there are those who refuse to recognize, well, how else could we say it, the plausibility of the talking ass. And however you want to look at the talking ass in scripture, because remember, for Catholics, um, we have a, a very sort of liberal view of our ideas of what's literal and what's poetic and what's figurative in scripture, right? We have a long history of feeling comfortable with talking about that. However you want to look at it, though, that uh, motif brings up the question, are miracles plausible in the modern world? Can we believe that miracles happened back then? And even more important for Dostoevsky, can we believe that miracles can happen right now in the midst of the most depraved family? Do we believe it can happen? And and Dostoevsky's answer is yes. And that's why this is a novel of hope. Um, Also very interesting, just to think again about this scripture. In the Bible, the ass speaks the language of humans and sees angels. But in the novel, the humans reject God and act like beasts. There is a persistent comparison in this novel of humans to roaches, vipers, insects. And so Dostoevsky, that's all very deliberate, what he's doing. And it's meant to startle the reader. So hopefully it's it's startling you. In this discussion of reason and faith, I thought I would also bring up a term that you may not be familiar with. um, uh, Casuistry. I believe it's the patriarch of the family who brings that up. This is a process of moral reasoning that it's, it's become pretty unpopular. Why? Well, what it is, is it's when you take moral theories and you apply them to specific cases. So for example, if you ever took a class on moral theology, you would have a theory of ethics, but you might say, well, I have a theory, but in a particular case, I'm actually going to look at the circumstances and maybe my final moral judgment will change. You can see how While this may be useful in certain cases, this is obviously a system that could be abused. If we look at early modern Europe, in particular, 
uh, 16th century, 17th century, this type of reasoning became associated in a negative way with the Jesuits. And if you read carefully, the Jesuits, I believe Dostoevsky has the term stinking Jesuits. Think of stinking Lizaveta. It's all connected. Do, uh, the Jesuits play an important role in this novel because Dostoevsky could not stand how, in his mind, the Jesuit mind could use reason in an excessive way to excuse evil. Now, um, the historian in me would just like to clarify a little bit. I think Dostoevsky's point is well taken, but I think it's good for us to get the whole picture. Very briefly, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola founded the Jesuits right at the turn of um, the, the modern world. I, I think he was born in 1492. So he definitely opens up the modern era. Ignatius suffered terribly from scruples. Uh, when he had his conversion, he never thought he was holy enough. He, he almost gave in to despair and wanted to take his own life. So in order to calm his own spirit, he invented the spiritual exercises. And it's a way to go into your imagination and relive your life with Christ. Well, no one had ever done that before. It's very modern. Um, the historian Paul Johnson says, he inadvertently gave an answer to Luther's arguments, how we need a, a, a personal God. Ignatius did that in the Catholic tradition. Well, you'll see that's all very modern. It's very subjective. So Ignatius said, we have an objective law of God, but we're going to apply it to each individual. That's actually very modern. It was revolutionary. Nowadays, we're very used to that. We have Ignatian private retreats. Back then, there were revolutionary things about it. And some Jesuit scholars, as the centuries went by, they misused some of it. And so I think that Dostoevsky's right. There were some um, unfortunate uh, Jesuitical tendencies in moral thought, but that's only a a piece of the picture, I would say, if I was going to, let's say, critique Dostoevsky, that's just one part. But I wanted to give you that background, because once we get to book five, and Yvonne presents his um, portrait of the Grand Inquisitor, you, ca you cannot understand it at all, if you don't realize the whole struggle with the Jesuits. That went on for centuries, okay, they're very controversial. Um, also, uh, Yvonne has, he has his moments in this book. Uh, at one point he talks about, um, I believe he calls it the progressive flesh. That might've been a phrase that threw you off. Just so you know, he's echoing an article from Herzen. Book three has a lot of authors that I introduced you to in that opening podcast. You could go back and look. Herzen was an intellectual influence by the West. Um, Yvonne is quoting from him, but when he's talking about that, Yvonne says, quote, it must be the devil. This is the first time Yvonne uses the devil's name in vain. From here on, we are going to get all these hints, hints that Yvonne is having secret dealings with the devil. He he's, has a relationship with him. And Dostoevsky is going to quietly introduce that to you. Um, we also hear in the arguments, just briefly want to draw your attention, ideas about, well, if God didn't exist, they'd have to invent him, those kind of things. They're quoting from Feuerbach, who was a German intellectual who influenced Karl Marx. This was the talk of the 1860s for sure. And so um, this is all very authentic. Okay, number two. We are looking at Dimitri and these monologues. And I mentioned to you last time to pay attention to his three confessions. Um, we'll look into this a little, a little uh, more closely. But just to recap, he confesses certain things he did in his military life, things he has done with women, and of course, things he has done with money. You know, all going to the 
3,000 rubles. So Dostoevsky scholars keep talking about the number 3,000 and 3,000 rubles and how that's going to keep showing up. That's another motif. Um, but in chapter four, Dimitri confesses to cruelly, to cruelty and depravity. Again, what does he call himself? A bed bug, an insect. He tells anecdotes about his military life. He took advantage of women, how he becomes engaged to Katerina. Katerina is a noble daughter. Remember, she's of a high social standing. This makes a difference in the story. Her father is a colonel. She's beautiful. She's educated and she's intelligent. She ignores Dimitri uh, with attitude. He wants revenge. Later, her father gets into trouble over 4,500 rubles of embezzled funds. He faces court martial. And then Dimitri tells Katerina's half sister to send Katerina to him. He will give her the money um, because he's just received a handout from his father. Um, when she comes to him to basically sell her body, to sacrifice herself to him, he hands the money back to her. And did you notice what he does to her? I mentioned to you, mentioned it to you um, in, in the beginning. He bows to her. This, this image of bowing is very important. And did you notice before she runs out, she bows to him. This bowing here is not the kind of bowing that the elder practices. It's a different kind of bowing. Um, now, there was other things I wanted to tell you in this, in this feverish monologue. I wanted you to think about the subject of confession in general. It's very important in this novel. Um, the reoccurring use of confessions um, happens in groups of three. Also notice that it happens in a garden. So that's very important as well. Um, Note here, I think this is so beautiful how Dostoevsky does this. Who is Alyosha imitating? You got it if you said the elder. He is paralleling the elder who in our last book had listened to the confessions of the peasant women. And now Alyosha is hearing a confession so to speak. And there is so much we could say about this, just a little bit of literary history. The very first confessions in the West were St. Augustine. He wrote his famous confessions in the fourth century about his inner torment and then his um, encounter with salvation. Well, later in the 18th century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, a philosopher who we call romantic because he reacted against the Enlightenment, wrote his own confessions. And it's a modern man's confessions about um, his life. And it's very romantic in the sense that I explained to you in that first podcast, looking at nature, um, highlighting the role of the individual, um, lessening the impact of reason. So when Dimitri is doing this, he's acting like a romantic hero. And boy, there's a lot here we can say. I could talk for an hour about Dimitri and what's happening here. We, we don't have time, but just a few things to note in his um, passionate speeches to Alyosha. Um, I think it's important to Remember, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about the poetry he's quoting from, but the poetry presents um, a, por a, 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 a portrait of pagan mythology. And again, here is Dostoevsky once more saying that this brother is trying to get in touch with Mother Earth, with the bottom, let's say, of our desires. That's why I love the chapter. It's called Heels Up. I wish I knew how to say it in Russian and how we could really hear it. But we definitely have this portrait of a man who says, I'm going down. I'm going to go all the way down and I'm going to wrestle with my own desires. And so my, my heels are going to be up there because I mentioned to you in the very beginning, all the characters have a descent and in a sense, and he's, he, he is exposing himself and saying what he's doing. When he talks about 
his bad behavior, um, he is placing himself um, as a character in mythology. He, we hear snatches of poetry that I would like to go into a little bit, but they're stressing, just so you know, this irresistible drive of his passion, as well as his deep disgust, disgust at his own nature. Um, what happens is, and he mentions, right, he says the battleground for man is in the heart. And he says, we're going to embrace Sodom. Or we're going to embrace the Madonna. That's the battle in every human heart. And it reminds me of the language Solzhenitsyn will use later on in, in the Gulag. He talks about the battle in every human heart. This is very Russian. Now, when, um, when Dmitry says that, Dostoevsky is, is taking that private battle, this private battle, and he is lifting it up in this novel as the struggle of humankind. Dostoevsky is saying at these times, we are embracing these social utopias because of the breakdown of the family, all these various factors. But at the end of the day, it is the battle in the heart. And Dimitri is the focal point for that. Um, and also, I want you to notice, though, even in his disgust, did you notice, though, there's authentic joy. We have the look at Schiller's um, his ode to joy. And he, I think, has authentic joy there. It's just the battle for it to be purified. Um, he's longing to obtain some type of, of self-respect. So let's look a little bit more closely at some of the poetry. Um, also, I didn't know if you noticed when he's speaking um, the way Dostoevsky writes it, it's supposed to be like a mystery novel of the 19th and 20th century, there's an atmosphere of secrecy. There's the back alleys. Um, the Russian word for secret is, is mentioned um, several times. Um, but let's look at some of the poetry. So the first I wanna look at our friend Schiller who appears in this, in this novel quite a bit. Schiller um, has a poem in German, which won't be, my German's not great. Das Elushische Fest or the Eleusinian Festival. I want to take time for this. This is very important for the novel. What are we talking about here? Well, these were cults for the pagans. These mysteries, they're called mysteries. These um, Eleusinian mysteries were celebrated every spring in honor of Demeter. Um, in Latin, we call her Ceres. And her daughter, Persephone, Persephina in Latin, and they symbolized the annual death and resurrection of nature. What happens was um, Ceres would descend from Mount Impolis in order to go down and search for her daughter. When she goes down, she's appalled at what she finds. Now, pay attention. These pagan characters go down. They go down. They don't like what they find. And Dimitri is associating himself with that descent. Um, this is the first time in the novel that the symbolism of Mother Earth appears. Um, and I think it's extremely important because Dostoevsky is following the tradition, the classical tradition of going down before you rise. Um, I believe I might have mentioned in another podcast, but the beginning of Plato's Republic um, he, he says, I went down. In Homer's Odyssey, we have Odysseus who has to go down to the underworld and meet with things from his past before he can rise up and go and reclaim his wife. We also have in Virgil's Aeneid, now we're entering um, the AD era, not BC anymore, in Virgil's Aeneid, Aeneas has to go to the underworld he also will have to deal with his past before he can come back up and be the founder of Rome. And then we jump to the medieval period and Dante has to go down. He wakes up in a dark wood in hell in the Inferno. 
He has to deal with all of that before he can rise up to purgatory and to paradiso. Well, Dostoevsky is building on this tradition and he is saying, yes, indeed, even in modern times, we have to go down. And that's what Dimitri is going through. Now, in this descent of Dimitri, did you notice his temptation? What was he tempted to do? Kill himself. Did you notice that? Um, I wanted to sh uh, show you that all four brothers, so when I say four, I'm including Smeryakov, each of them faces a crisis leading to despair where they contemplate suicide. Very important to notice Mitya's uh, temptation. It's with a shirt. He is tempted to hang himself with a shirt. And that word in Russian goes all the way back to Dmitri's childhood when he was so neglected that he didn't have a shirt to wear. Um, and, and when we read that, we're thinking, oh, this pathetic little boy. Well, that little boy felt so unloved and so pathetic and so neglected that that self that self-loathing lingers. It stays with him. It stays with him. It stays with him. Now he's in his 20s. And his feelings of himself as an insect have risen to the boiling point and he is tempted to kill himself. So very um, complicated, but uh, sharp psychological picture that Dostoevsky is drawing for us. Now, I also want to look at another. There's a lot of poets here. We don't have time to look at all of them. I wanted to talk about a poet named uh, Nikolai Nikrasov because he was big in Russia and Dostoevsky knew him and greatly admired him. He didn't think he was perfect, but he had a big place in his life. So I want to talk about him. He lived in the early 19th century. He was a poet who was devoted to writing poems about the Russian peasantry, but with a compassionate eye. So he was a hero of the liberal and radical circles of the intelligentsia. Of course, we remember Dostoevsky was a member of these circles. Um, he is credited uh, with introducing new literary techniques into poetry, um, the dramatic monologue, for example. But the poem that Dimitri uh, quotes from is from a very famous poem that I'm going to read to you, even though we just get a snippet in the book. Um, it, depending on your translation, it's called When from Thy Shame, or other translations, When from the Darkness of Delusion. And this is, some people say, the first poem ever in Russian history about a woman driven to prostitution because of her poverty. This is a favorite topic for Dostoevsky if you're familiar with um, crime and punishment. Um, the hardened revolutionary Chernichevsky, if you remember, I told you about him in the first podcast. He was brought to tears when he first read the poem. He said, I rode the dark streets through the night. Um, so that really affected him. Do you remember the author of Fathers and Sons, Turgenev? I mentioned him in the first podcast. He said, the first time I read this poem, it drove me mad. I repeated it day and night until I learned it by heart. So I'm just kind of letting you know that when Mitya is quoting from this poem, everybody knew it by heart. It had such an effect. Now I'm going to read it to you in a different translation. It'll be a little bit different than Mitya's translation that we have with the Garnet, but I put it in bold and you'll see it on a slide. When from thy shame, degrading dark, I drew thy fallen spirit out with words of flame. And thou with wringing hands in anguish deep did curse the sin that compassed thee about. When thou did lash thy conscience late and dull with story of thy past, confessing all. Which was before I came in sudden torn by shame and fears and trembling crushed. I saw thee hide thy face and yield to floods of tears. Believe I pitied, yearn to hear each word. I understood thee, woman of great sorrow, and I forgave, and I forgot it all. Then why each hour strive thus with secret doubt? Art even now the slave of sham opinion? Fear not the careless insult of the crowd, their lying empty words, and cherish not. Each sickly thought within thy frightened heart, tis vain by sorrowing thus 
to suckle serpents upon thy breast, but enter free and bold as glad and rightful mistress of my house. So just this welcoming poem of forgiveness um, meant a lot to the intelligentsia of the 1860s. And we have um, Mitya quoting it. The translation that we have is distrust the worthless lying crowd and lay aside thy doubts. So Mitya says that um, while he's drinking his brandy, just kind of a side note, brandy is another literary motif for Dostoevsky shows up. There's a chapter called over the brandy. I'm not going to say I'm completely convinced about what it means, but a thought I have is uh, Russians often drink vodka. Brandy is French. A lot of times, have you noticed there are French phrases in the book and some think that's Dostoevsky's way of saying once again, why are we Russian people borrowing in artificial ways things from the West, particularly France, at the wrong at the wrong moment and at the wrong time that don't suit us, that rob us of our authentic identity? So just a thought, but the brandy shows up quite a bit. Um when does when excuse me when Dimitri talks about himself and his agony, you see there are long quotes of poetry there. And I thought it might be helpful for a moment to think about the role of text in this book, in this novel. In this novel, words from other works show up repeatedly. And I think it's helpful to um, look at it in the big picture. And if we look at it in the big picture, there are actually tons of little ones, but six gigantic ones, which I'm going to share with you. But when this happens, it's all leading up to something. Each um, big quotation, if you'll pay attention, Alyosha is always present. So whenever a character is quoting from a text or writing their own poetry. In some of these smatterings, it's media's own poetry. Alyosha is always there. Also, a story is told that is separate from the flow of the story. So it's, it's, it's a side view. It's a digression, let's say an interruption. And in each incident, the actual words are important and they have a, an effect on the characters. So just to kind of get you looking ahead, there are six big ones we're going to see the famous poem of the Grand Inquisitor. We're also going to see Alyosha's response to that. Grushenka is going to tell the tale of the onion. Father uh, Zosima, we're going to see his autobiography. Um, Alyosha has a vision that he talks about at, the, at Cana of Galilee. And at the very end, Alyosha has special words for boys at the end of the novel. So very important, the role of texts, the role of words, quoted poetry, and poetry just made up on the spot. That's all very important. As we end with our look at, at Dimitri and his, his confessions, Dostoevsky has built up some suspense. There is the sense that he's afraid he's going to commit a murder. Is he going to commit a murder? That question is there. Or are we going to see a miracle? And that question is there in his, in his torment. Okay, number three, why is beauty a terrible thing? I'll just start off by saying, why, is, why are we certain that Grushenka is beautiful but going to be ugly by the age of 30? I just think when we read that, it's just oh, Dostoevsky. But that's just a side note. The question of beauty is very important in this novel. So let's look at it um, as a terrible thing. Is it terrible? Well, what do you think? Um, I do think whether it's terrible or whether it's beautiful or whether it's both, Dostoevsky uses the theme of beauty um, as a symphonic motif. This chapter climaxes in a discourse on beauty and passion. Um, at first, beauty is introduced in a casual way. He likes to do that. And then it builds up um, very dramatically. 
I also think um, beauty is connected to the fall and resurrection of man. So we were looking at that pagan poetry going up and down, definitely has the high and the low. And what about Grushenka's beauty? Well, both Grushenka and Katerina are beauty, are beautiful. I think Grushenka's maybe has a little more for us to chew on. Do you remember how Dostoevsky describes her beauty? Anybody remember? Um, she is described as looking like the Venus de Milo. Now, my first thought is, well, she doesn't have any arms. <laughs> but of course, that's not what Dostoevsky means. She, um, well, think about it. She's being compared to a goddess. She has the awful beauty of a goddess because her beauty is so terrible that she makes Dimitri and his father mad. They go crazy with desire. So in this sense, we, we could say beauty is terrible and how, how they succumb to that temptation. But also, I also think beauty is terrible for Dostoevsky because of the fleeting nature of beauty. So he writes about on the one hand, she's beautiful like a goddess, but on the other hand, he also talks about typical Russian beauty, and he basically says by a certain age, she's not going to be beautiful anymore, and, and yet this whole novel shows characters captivated by beauty, but we know in this novel, Dostoevsky's a Christian, so no beauty on the earth is going to last, so the characters have to rise from clinging to earthly beauty, looking at it just as a portal to enter into eternal beauty, which is Christ alone. And the stakes are high and the struggle is real. I also think it's interesting in the very disturbing portrait that we have of Smerdyakov, and hopefully you were disturbed and you should be disturbed. It's, it, it says, like a typical Karamazov, he also loves beauty. Um, in his own way, he's described as an artist. Also, when we look at the theme of beauty, uh, Dostoevsky was very drawn to great works of art. Um, he loved, for example, Raphael's Sistine Madonna. He sat for hours staring at that. So we shouldn't be surprised. He brings up an artist in this uh, chapter, in this book, the artist Kromskoy, who we're looking at now. He painted a painting called The Contemplator. Uh, this artist uh, lived in the 19th century. He died in 1887. Dostoevsky actually knew him well. But what I think is actually really fascinating about this is the the portrait that we're looking at of this person contemplating. And again, when we have these paintings of individuals all alone contemplating nature, that is the portrait par excellence of your romantic hero, right? Very much connected to, as I mentioned in the first podcast, um, intellectuals who were responding to the enlightenment by saying, no, we are, uh, romantic men, we enjoy nature and emotion. So this was very much an icon of that movement. But people in Russia had actually connected this painting to Jacquerie, or let's call it radical revolutionaries. So the painting comes to be associated with youthful, idealistic ideas about revolutions, right? This is this is being young and having ideals, but be careful. What is Dostoevsky doing? He's saying, when you have this type of emotion, this unbridled romanticism, and you don't keep an eye on it, and you don't connect it to morality and our traditions as a nation, you are going to end up with violent revolution. And I think this is another way why beauty is dangerous because a lot of these characters have beautiful ideals, but what is going to happen with them? You know, ultimately they're going to end in a bloodbath 
And I think um, the danger of beauty there is very important. So number four, what is the real foundation of the relationship between Katerina and Dimitri. And if you're disturbed by their relationship, you should be. Um, I mentioned earlier, they're bowing to each other and what is happening. Um, so Katerina, first of all, she's, she's not a person um, to be trusted. She is someone who enjoys being a martyr of virtue. She enjoys being someone who can lord her humility over another person. And of course, Dimitri has enjoyed humiliating her. So if we kind of just look like in a microscope at this situation, um, when he decides to make the proposition that he's going to, let's say, buy her or buy a night with her, and then he refuses her. Just the way that they both want to hurt each other and humiliate each other, and also the way that they are dis have such degrees of self-deception is extremely important. Um, I think in addition to bowing, it's also important to think about um, kissing of the hand. We'll see that with uh, Grushenka. Let's look at some of Katerina's words because I think that that's going to um, remind us of how deeply flawed her motives are. I'm on page 83. Dimitri says, three days later, the promise letter. I have it with me now. You must read it. She offers to be my wife, offers herself to me. I love you madly, she says, even if you don't love me. Never mind. Be my husband. Don't be afraid. I won't hamper you in any way. I will be your chattel. I will be the carpet under your feet. I want to love you forever. I want to save you from yourself. What is happening here? So I think it's very important. I'm sure you already recognize beneath this exaggerated humility is the deepest form of pride. So Dostoevsky is a master at looking at how tortured relationships mask a deep form of pride. And this form of pride is so complicated because it also doesn't allow for the character to receive any love. So as you see, their relationship is built on revenge, pride, and self-deception. And what's fascinating in this whole thing is who then promptly fall, actually does fall in love with Katerina? Ivan, he does fall in love with her. So it's interesting. Um, to, to see all of that. And I think the perfect line is what Mitya tells his brother, Alyosha. He says, she loves her own virtue, not me. Uh, again, I am always amazed at how Dostoevsky was a man before his time. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever read the former uh, John Paul II before he was Pope as Carol Votiwa. He wrote Love and Responsibility. And he writes a lot about how sometimes when we fall in love, we're actually falling in love with ourself or, or parts of ourself we wish we would see in others. It's very complicated. I give the Pope a lot of credit for breaking that down. So this, these are two people who perhaps have fallen in love, but there's a lot of um, self, uh, self, let's say, false healing going on. So very interesting. And we will see what erupts between them. Okay, let's compare Katerina and Grushenka. Uh, two very interesting women. They're both beautiful. They're both in the chapter called um, the sensualists. Uh, Katerina is always associated with the words kindness and generosity. 
Um, so keep that in mind, you know, whether or not that is authentic. We talked a little bit earlier about Grushenka and her goddess-like features. She is someone who has been mistreated by a man and her struggle is going to be, how is she going to respond to other men? Is she going to make other men pay her whole life? So that is a big struggle for her. Um, and notice she does not let Katerina treat her the way Katerina has been able to manipulate others. So if you carefully study the interactions between the two women, you can see um, Grushenka outwitting Katerina. I do think um, Joseph Frank has a fascinating analysis of Katerina. If you remember, she does say at one point, this is so chilling. I will be a God to whom Dimitri can pray. So remember, she's saying, oh, you can walk on me, Dimitri. I love you. I'm humble. I'm your wife. Dostoevsky's taking these um, kind words, let's say. He is shining the light on something demonic because she's saying, um, I will be your God. What's happening here? If you're getting to know uh, Dostoevsky's uh, technique, can you tell he's always having other characters mirror each other? Who is she mirroring, do you think? Well, if you thought, Yvonne, you were correct. So let's look at what's happening. This is a carefully um, planned thematic structure. All the attitudes exhibited by Katerina vis-a-vis the other characters are the exact replica on the moral psychological level of Yvonne's own ideological dilemma. Let me say that sentence again. All the attitudes exhibited by Katerina vis-a-vis the other characters are the exact replica on the moral psychological level of Yvonne's ideological dilemma. Kat- Katerina um, expands and rounds out the human qualities of Yvonne's character. So she's mirroring some of the dark elements of Yvonne in her own way, in, in a poetic, symbolic way. Think about it. Yvonne's intellectual arrogance, his spiritual egoism, prevent him from surrendering to the mystery of faith. And also, this is what's so tragic. They prevent him from surrendering to God's love. Now, Katerina's inability to love anyone but herself is the same thing, really. Her, she's always brooding. She's always the martyr. Her painful brooding will only reinforce and strengthen the rampant egoism that she has concealed underneath her her beauty, her sophistication, her wonderful words. So just as Katerina needs Dimitri's, Dimitri's betrayals to reinforce her own virtue, so Ivan tortures himself with the sufferings of the innocent children so that he can reject God's love. If you really think about it, this is a masterpiece, how Dostoevsky has done that. When Katerina hysterically cries in a frenzy, I will be a God to whom Dimitri can pray, she reveals the deepest meaning of Yvonne's legend of the Grand Inquisitor. Number six, why is this book called The Sensualists? It's no simple thing, is it? Because on the one hand, we meet worthless and depraved characters, right? Especially we see in the beginning, Theodore describes what he did to women and especially to the mother of Alyosha and Yvonne. We we see that in detail and, and it's painful to read. When we read about what men have done to women, I think Dostoevsky is asking the question, are all men sensualists? And I think he goes further and is asking us, if so, how does one live in the contradiction 
Dimitri locates in his own heart. So we have examples of this disturbing nature of man. And then we go really deep into it. And Dimitri is saying, how do I live with this? What do I do? And he sees that suicide is not the answer. On the other hand, I think there's some irony here, because if you noticed, Father Zosima is accused of being a sensualist. Um, Makes me think of when Jesus gets in trouble for eating with the tax collectors. So there's always the truth and then false accusations. That's all jumbled together in there. So I think, um, why is this book called The Sensualist? That is the central question. And I think it's also important, all the images of the insects remind us of that as well. So not a book for the faint of heart. Well, as we close book three, let's just, just a few interesting things to consider. Um, I haven't mentioned too much the character of Lisa. She has a letter for Alyosha where she claims she loves him. I didn't want you to miss out on the fact that Dostoevsky is poking great fun at her because um, the letter comes almost word for word from uh, a letter in the famous, famous novel, Eugene Onegin, which was a novel by Pushkin. Um, and so Dostoevsky is almost kind of saying, yep, she plagiarized that or she cut and pasted it from Wikipedia kind of thing. So she is such a She's such an interesting character. What to make of her, I'm still not quite sure. But I I like how Dostoevsky is always playing with the words of his time, going back to the importance of um, text. Also, I want to draw your attention to Water and Yvonne. If you remember, we showed you symbols for each of the brothers. Yvonne's symbol is water, and that's going to be important later on, because in a dramatic scene, later at the end of the book, Yvonne is going to say, for Christ's sake, can anyone get me a glass of water? And in some ways, that's what this whole novel is about. Will we do it for the sake of Christ? If we believe in Christ, Will we give each other a glass of water? Well, for Yvonne, the answer is no. He, he doesn't think he's ever received a glass of water. So if you notice on page 99, Yvonne, Yvonne, water, quickly. I just think there's just little hints there that remind us of those kinds of things. Um, also, this is very important. Did you notice that Yvonne makes a distinction between thought and action. We, we read in here how, yes, he, he wishes his father was dead. He, he wishes somebody would kill his father, but he's not going to do it, he says. So he's kind of saying, hmm, I'm not guilty if I don't do it. And Dostoevsky's saying, hold on. Dostoevsky is saying, we all have to examine our own wishes buried in the depths of our heart and these wishes along with deeds are actually sins that have to be atoned for and this is going to lead us to as we keep reading um the idea that we are all responsible for all all creation is sinful We take responsibility for everyone's sins in a dramatic way in this novel. And then I just want you to think about this. Think about it. In this book, in some way, every single character is guilty for the murder of Theodore. While there will certainly be one literal murderer, everyone has murdered him in one way or the other by their wishes or things that they did or things they didn't do. They're all, everybody's responsible for everyone. And this is 
Dostoevsky's um, idea of true solidarity, not Marxist solidarity, but solidarity as um, human beings who are fallen and sinful and can only receive redemption from Christ. By the way, just a quick the theological note, that is actually Augustine's um, theory. That's Western, not Eastern. Augustine said he really drew on the fact that St. Paul says, we all died with Adam. We all sinned with Adam. We all died with Adam and we all rise with Christ. And for Augustine, that's the foundation for true human community. It's in sin and, and resurrection. And so this is not different at all. It's just in a more Eastern way, but just wanted to remind us that that actually goes back to the church fathers. So uh, Yvonne's wishes are dark and they are important. Also notice Yvonne's behavior. You're going to start to see his behavior and his heart that has some good in it and can't come to terms with evil in the world, we are going to start to see these two split. And his personality cannot handle the split. So we're going to see this cut intensify. And we're going to see what happens to him. And the word that he uses in this book, um, vipers, it's going to come back to haunt him. And keep in mind, Smerdyukov is Ivan's alter ego. So I mentioned Ivan has a good heart in some ways, but the worst of Ivan goes into Smerdyukov. And of course, who's the stable character worried about all of these characters? It's Alyosha. And we read with, with Alyosha, see, Alyosha seeing everything happen. And he knows deep down something worse is going to happen. We read, quote, his heart ached, his heart ached. So this is a man who has a heart for his family. And we will see how events unfold in book four. As you move to book four, keep in mind, uh, we're going to see the very beginning of Father Zosima's words about what I was telling you earlier all creation is sinful. We need to take responsibility for all. So be on the lookout for the foundation for that, um, that theory. And thank you for joining me uh, in book three of the Brothers Karamazov.